uh, directs and actually founded the biomedical ethics uh, educational unit um, at the Mayo Clinic, where he presently is the director of that program. And uh, so we are very fortunate to have Dr. Hook with us, so why don't you join me in welcoming him. Good morning again. I uh, need to apologize in advance <clears throat> about this voice uh, that has come on this morning, and I would appreciate your prayers that I can get through um, the, the presentation uh, reasonably well. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to be here and to participate in this conference, and I'm particularly pleased to be the uh, first half of the By Hook or By Cook show uh, <clears throat> today. And, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some new uh, developments uh, that you may not be as familiar with uh, in regard to cybernetics and nanotechnology. Last night we heard from Dr. Collins uh, a wonderful expression of some of the tremendous benefits and also the concerns that are with us in regard to the use of uh, genetic information. And yet, now we are on the verge of a new age through other technologies that have just as equally sweeping a potential to transform or recreate human beings and into any number and manner of forms, these being these technologies of cybernetics and nanotechnology. Now, unfortunately, our conception of cybernetics or bionics uh, has generally been formed by Hollywood and are thus dismissed uh, as remote fantasy. And most, in my experience, have heard little to nothing of nanotechnology, or at least not until the recent uh, field day the press had with an article written by Bill Joy in the April issue of uh, Wired Magazine, about which more I'll speak in due course. Therefore, one of my primary goals today is to bring you up to speed on what is happening in these fields, as well as begin an exploration of some of the eth ethical issues that we're going to be confronted with. First, the term cybernetics was coined in 1948 by Norbert Weiner, and a popularized version of his work was published a couple of years later under the very provocative title, The Human Use of Human Beings. He viewed that successful function both in the mechanical world and in the biological world was very dependent upon the feedback loop. In other words, that information would constantly be reevaluated and recycled within the machine or organism to optimize its function. And he saw that there was a tremendous similarity in machines and biological organisms in this way, and therefore, why not bring them together using those same uh, mechanisms <clears throat> and blend them together and possibly make a superior process? Then in 1960, Manfred Kleins and Nathan Klein took this concept a little further and considered its use to improve human astronauts for spaceflight. And they coined the term cyborg, or cybernetic organism, to refer to the blending of technology and man. And their speculations resulted in a 1963 NASA study engineering man for space, the cyborg study. <clears throat> now, to the extent that most of us have come to depend upon technologies uh, such as filled teeth, we wear glasses, we have pacemakers, uh, hearing aids, <clears throat> hair pieces, vaccinations, and even such things as Prozac, we are all cyborgs. <clears throat> but far beyond anything we have seen thus far, we are on the verge of a bold new era of incredible cybernetic enhancements. Let me just share with you in the next few minutes some of the recent developments in this field. Peter Fromherz and colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen, Germany, have successfully grown connections between the neurons of several species of animal and transistors, allowing two-way communication through the silicon neuronal junction. Last year, scientists at ACP, or MCP Hahnemann School of Medicine and Duke University collaborated to produce a rat with electrodes implanted in its brain, which allowed the rat to open a door to get its treat merely by thinking about it. 
Also last year, um, researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, were able to measure the, the neuronal activity of 177 cells in the optical pathways of a cat, process this information, and recreate rough images of what the cat's eyes were viewing at that time. The top um, being the uh, actual image presented and the bottom being the reconstruction. Now you can see they're rough, but yet that they could even come to that degree of understanding of processing that information is staggering. <clears throat> this January, the DeBell Institute reported using neural implants to help a 62-year-old man blind since the age of 36 to perceive rough images composed of small dots of light that enabled him to read large letters and to navigate around large, big objects. Investigators at Emory University have helped two patients with locked-in syndrome, a state in which the brain is conscious but cannot produce any movement uh, among the skeletal muscles. Patients are often viewed to be in a persistent vegetative state, but the tragic reality is that they are locked in to this non-functioning body. These two patients received brain implants into which their neurons connected and grew, establishing a link with a computer. And this enabled the patients, through the use of their minds, to control the movement of the cursor on the computer screen so that they could then communicate with those around them. Just within the last month, there have been two major announcements. In the June 22nd issue of Nature, Richard Hanloser and colleagues reported the successful creation of a new type of silicon chip that uses both digital selection and analog amplification in mimicry of the way nerve cells really do work in the human brain. Ultimately, such devices will allow much easier integration of cybernetic prostheses with the brain. And then, just a couple of weeks ago, right here in Chicagoland, the first artificial retinas made from silicon chips were implanted in the eyes of three blind patients suffering from retinitis pigmentosa. It will be probably later at the end of this month or early August before we're going to learn how successful these devices are. But each implant is only about two millimeters in diameter, a thousandth of an inch thick, and yet contains approximately 3,500 microphotodiodes that convert light energy into electrical impulses to still stimulate the remaining uh, nerve cells that are functioning in the retina to help the blind to see. <clears throat> For many years, Steve Mann, now at the University of Toronto, has been perfecting what he describes as wearable computers. They have now achieved the degree of miniaturization that the devices look like part of a normal wardrobe. The purpose of these devices is to provide constant access to the user by the user to uh, computer networks. And he writes, quote, every morning I decide how I will see the world that day. Sometimes I give myself eyes in the back of my head. Other days I add a sixth sense, such as the ability to feel objects at a distance. Things appear differently to me than to other people. And in addition to having the internet and massive databases and video at my beck and call most of the time, I'm also constantly connected to others. While I'm at the grocery store shopping, my wife, who may be at home or in her office, sees exactly what I see and helps me pick out the vegetables. She can imprint images into my retina while she is seeing what I see. And then he goes on to extol the benefits of always being able to appear the expert on any topic because of his access to the vast amounts of information contained in the internet almost simultaneously. He has also recruited others into his new way of living. He led a class of 20 students teaching them how to use and blend with their quote personal imaging and photoquintographic image processing devices and notes that 16 of the 20 did not return the cybernaut computers at the end of the course. <clears throat> He states, all have been marked for life. They have been assimilated. A chilling, if not too far off the mark, reference to a race of cybernetic beings who inhabit the Star Trek universe of the 24th century. The Borg, as they are called, expand their race and culture by assimilating other races and individuals, reducing them to clones and drones, which they then become part of the larger one-minded collective their individuality destroyed and their knowledge absorbed to the service of the whole. But it is not the cybernetic implants alone 
that initiate the assimilation process to become Borg. These are actually added later to improve connectivity with the collective and provide various prostheses to assist the drone in the performance of that uh, drone's specific duties. Rather, assimilation begins from within. As the body is remodeled literally cell by cell and sometimes molecule by molecule by microscopic nanorobots that are injected into the victim's body. Now this is of course science fiction for the moment, but nanotechnology upon which this concept is based is actually a very thriving and growing field. The term nanotechnology was coined in 1974 by a Japanese researcher, Norio Taniguchi, to mean precision machining with tolerances of a micrometer or less. But it was Eric Drexler who brought uh, the word about nanotechnology into the public consciousness with a 1986 book, Engines of Creation, and then later a very scholarly technical treatise, uh, which was a feasibility study called Nanosystems. Drexler created the Foresight Institute uh, in the late 80s, dedicated to the development of life extension technologies and with a particular commitment to nanotechnology. The real originator of this idea, however, which deals literally with the engineering on the molecular or atomic level, was physicist Richard Feynman in a speech entitled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, that he gave at the end of 1959 to the annual meeting of the American Physical Society. Dr. Feynman then spoke of printing the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin, such that it could be read by an electron microscope. Now, that might not be as handy a way to store information as a palm pilot, but the concept of being able to manipulate things on this scale, to store information at this level, was staggering. Because the scale in order to do this is literally on the nanometer scale, that is one billionth of a meter. To give you a point of reference, the DNA molecule that we talked a lot about last night is 2.3 nanometers wide. If you take 10 hydrogen atoms and put them side by side, that will come to a span of one nanometer. Yet Feynman stated, I am not inventing anti-gravity, which is possible someday only if the laws are not what we think. I am telling you that this can be done if the laws are what we think. We are not doing it simply because we haven't gotten around to it. So what has been achieved in the quest for molecular engineering thus far? Last year, two groups of researchers independently fabricated a transistor out of a single carbon molecule. Another group has made a, a molecule that rotates acting as a nano wheel, as well as a rudimentary abacus with single molecules acting as the sliding beads. Two groups reporting in the same uh, September 1999 issue of Nature have described building molecular motors. Now one method of pursuing the development of nanomolecular devices is to use molecular tools already used by nature, but in new ways. Montenegro and colleagues last year successfully tested the use of an ATPase-dependent motor protein as a source of power for nanomolecular devices. ATP, of course, being one of the most plentiful molecules in cells already and critical to cellular energy utilization and storage. Just a couple of weeks ago, in a June 30th issue of Science, Edwin Yeager and colleagues reported on a synthesized micro-robot that could move micrometer-sized objects about in a directed field while in a liquid media. Though not a true nanomolecular device, these robots could manipulate single cells or cell-sized particles about in an area of 250 by 100 nanometers. We're getting close. An important part of any nanorobot will be its control and information processing systems illustrating the necessity for nanoscale or molecular computing. Even back in 1994, Leonard Adelman at UCLA reported in Science the use of DNA to encode a small graft to solve a complex combinatorial mathematics problem known as the Hamiltonian path problem. In this year's uh, February 2000 proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Laura Landweber of Princeton described the use of an RNA computer to solve a chess, pro a chess problem. That problem being list all the possible arrangements of any number of knights on a chessboard so that no knight is threatening another. 
Now, the board was restricted to nine squares to keep the possible nine arrangements only to 512. Aside from solving chess problems microscopically, though, what is nanotechnology going to do for us? Though a multitude of manufacturing and energy engineering uses have been proposed, let's focus for a few moments on the potential medical uses. And primarily, nanorobots will serve as in vivo implantable devices that could potentially detect and destroy malignant degeneration or seek out and destroy cancer when it is already developed, detect and combat infection as little immune machines, detect and repair genetic mutation or injury, deliver targeted drug therapy by in vivo synthesis and administration, replace cellular structures with stronger or more efficient uh, materials, replace or repair damaged tissues and non-cellular connective tissue materials such as the extracellular matrix, replace or augment physiological functions, remove atherosclerotic plaque in coronary and cerebral arteries preventing stroke and myocardial infarction. Now clearly, with tools like these, if eventually developed, we could significantly prolong the lives of many people and reduce much disability and suffering. In fact, many of the nanovisionaries see nanotechnology as an important means to forestall aging or even to pursue immortality. Robert Freitas, a pioneer in the field of nanomedicine, has already begun publishing rudimentary designs for what he describes as respirocytes, artificial blood cells that can deliver oxygen to tissue, and perhaps in situations when blood may not be available. He gave me the pleasure recently of reviewing and uh, making some suggestions to his plans for a clotocyte, an artificial platelet. Now clearly, these designs that we're talking about await the technological developments necessary to create those required molecular components. But Freitas and others have been very thorough in their evaluation of the physical, biochemical, and engineering concerns for such projects and have found them quite feasible, just as Feynman predicted. Last fall, Freitas released an immense treatise, the first of three planned volumes on the feasibility and, impl and implementation of nanomedical devices. His work is but one example of serious commitment to nanotechnology already taking place. In 1997, for instance, the, D the Department of Defense Military Health Services System published a large study on the use of nanotechnology in medicine, which also considered how to counter threats from nano devices that could be designed to serve as biological weapons. This spring, President Clinton announced the National Nanotechnology Technology Initiative, devoting $497 million in year 2001 for nanotechnology research. At least 23 major universities in the United States have made major investments in nanotechnology research in the last couple of years, and many of the giants of industry have also uh, been pursuing their own nanotech research programs, including IBM, Hewitt Packard, Texas Instruments, and Xerox. We're beginning to amass the degree of effort uh, that we saw uh, with the Human Genome Project. And we saw how rapidly things occurred with that effort. Last year, three new technical journals alone were uh, launched devoted to this field, and the elder statesman nanotechnology uh, published by the Institute of Physics is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Without question, this is a viable and exploding field. Now, both cybernetics and nanotechnology are tremendously exciting and challenging endeavors. They promise phenomenal medical therapies. With cybernetics, we have the opportunity to help the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, and those who may be bound by physical or neurological afflictions to interact more dynamically with their world, if not even to overcome those limitations. And nanotechnology could help us to fight cancer or vascular disease or infectious disease. But both have their potential dark sides as well. It is one thing to use technology to repair an injury or address an affliction, but these tools may and will indeed be used for enhancement purposes for engineering better human beings. There's already going to be an attraction for the well to enhance themselves for a competitive edge via cybernetics or to increase longevity via nanotechnology. 
Therefore, some of the first ethical questions that this raises are actually some of the same ones that we share with genetic engineering. Who will and should have access to these technologies? Can we define a clear line of demarcation between the use of a technology for treatment purposes versus the use for enhancement purposes? Issues of height, strength, visual acuity, and intelligence are often seen as simple attributes. But to some, their allotted attributes are seen as disabilities, including significant suffering. So where do we draw the line? And even if we could make clear distinctions, are there sufficient reasons to prevent the use of these technologies for enhancement? For all, is it not the desire, the laudable goal for us to improve ourselves and our children as much as possible? Well, many of the proponents of nanotechnology envision a world of prosperity and material sufficiency for all, but aren't we really not more likely to see different classes or groups arise? The enhanced versus the unenhanced and inferred inferior naturally based model? or as some authors, of, authors have described, homo sapiens versus techno sapiens. Won't we see significant discrimination against the unenhanced? As Mark Hansen has recently written, enhancement technologies on the whole progressively redefine normality as disease and ultimately devalue the created self. This tendency to discrimination, if not outright contempt for the less than ideal, is well illustrated in the comments of Dr. Robert Rubin in a presidential address to the American Society of Pediatric Otolaryngology. Rubin drew a link between hearing loss and criminal behavior. He renounced those parents who would not allow their deaf children to have cochlear implants, and we can certainly quarrel about that. But it is his reasoning that disturbs me because he warns that those with communication disorders present a threat to the progress and prosperity of America because they are economically burdensome and destructive to the social fabric. Further, some see these evolving technologies as a mean to free themselves and mankind from the finitudes of our puny bodies. This thinking has become known as transhumanism or posthumanism. And this mindset is actually, in my mind, the demon child of a marriage of the worst elements of modern and postmodern thought together. For modernism, we take an almost blind faith in inevitable progress, with the good defined as the suppression, replacement, or total control of the natural via technology and science. Radical autonomy is its creed, declaring the right and duty of each person to control her own destiny, to engineer her own evolution. From postmodernism and its rejective of objective truth, and even the notion of a true identifiable self, is taken the belief that there is nothing intrinsically valuable about the biological form, and particularly not the human form. Because there are no true norms of existence or behavior, we may create any, any reality we desire and change ourselves in any manner to our own suiting. Catherine Hales has identified four key assumptions behind post-human thought. She says, first, the post-human view privileges information pattern over material instantiation so that embodiment in a biological substrate is seen as an accident of history rather than, in, rather than an inevitability of life. Second, the post-human post view considers consciousness as an epiphenomenon, not of something of intrinsic uh, being or essence. Third, the post-human thinks of the body as the original prosthesis. We all learn to manipulate so that extending or replacing the body with other prostheses becomes a continuation of a process that we began before birth. And last, the post-human view configures human beings so that it can be seamlessly articulated with intelligent machines. For in the post-human, there are no essential differences or absolute demarcations between bodily existence and computer simulation, between cybernetic mechanism and biological organism, between robot technology and human goals. She concludes her book entitled How We Became Post-Human, quote, humans can either go gently into that good night, joining the dinosaurs as a species that once ruled the earth but is now obsolete, or hang on for a while longer by becoming machines themselves. In either case, the age of the human is drawing to a close. 
Let me share with you a few other quotes that illustrate this type of thinking. The astronomer Richard Jastrow, in his book, The Enchanted Loom, writes of a time when a bold scientist will be able to tap the contents of his mind and transfer them into the metallic lattices of a computer. Because mind is the essence of being, it can be said that this scientist has entered the computer and that he now dwells, it, dwells in it. At last, the human brain, ensconced in a computer, has been liberated from the weakness of the mortal flesh. It is in control of its own destiny. It seems to me that this must be the mature form of intelligent life in the universe. Housed in the indestructible lattices of silicon and no longer constrained in the span of its years by the life and cycle of biological organisms, such a kind of life could live forever. This is also the thesis of a recent book by Ray Kurzweil entitled The Age of Spiritual Machines. Kurzweil, following the implications of Moore's Law, which states that the computational speed of computers doubles every 18 to 24 months, believes that we will soon be able to analyze and replicate the entire synaptic structure of a person's brain by digital simulation, allowing the person to be uploaded into a machine. And he declares, we will be software, not hardware. Now, as we learned uh, from our first talk this morning, the actual feasibility of this happening, which is certainly by no means certain, uh, is one thing. But what troubles me is the fact that these people think this is desirable, that this is a goal that we should pursue. Virginia Postrel, in her book, The Future and Its Enemies, states, the biological doesn't have the corner on natural. If natural is itself a dynamical process rather than a static end, then there is no single form of the natural. An evolving, evolving open-ended, mature, or nature may impose practical constraints, but it cannot dictate eternal standards. It cannot determine what is good. The distinction between the artificial and the natural must lie not in their source, human or not, but in their characteristics, in the way they relate to the world around them. Or Kevin Warwick writing this year in Wired magazine, I was born human, but that was an accident of fate, a condition merely of time and place. I believe it is something we have the power to change. Now compare this with a line from Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. I teach you the overman. Man is something that is to be, to, is to be overcome. Indeed, transhumanist thought in my mind is nothing more than the Nietzschean ideal of the will to power. But it is not just the human form that is to be challenged and overcome. It is the very idea of the self that must be destroyed as well. If we can, through our cybernetic enhancement, enter worlds of virtual reality, the self becomes plastic, malleable, into anyone or anything we desire. Jerry Fink writes in Cyber Seduction, virtual reality simulations as copies of actuality can become our new reality. We can play with our conflicts, rehearse and reenact them with the fantasy of achieving a resolution. Families can be perfect, enemies can be murdered, and we can rise to become the heroes and heroines of our own worlds. Fink then proceeds to uh, document in page after page examples of individuals already who are using the internet to escape their real lives, creating new persona, changing sexes, and engaging in all forms of activities that they would not consider doing in the quote unquote real world. A new apple is once again offering a means to rise above our small limited selves and allow us to be as God. Now frightening as the thought of the loss of self into alternate realities may seem to you or me, many will and actually do find this attractive. One of the challenges of growing up and living as an adult it involves making mistakes and living with their consequences and living with the reality of sin and guilt. It is the reality of the responsible self. But if one can deny the self, one can then seemingly escape from responsibility and from guilt. And this strikes me as sort of the essence of Buddhist philosophy. And it's frightening to me that at a time when there's this incredible rise of interest in Buddhism in our culture and this growing post-humanist type of thought that we now have 
developing at the same time technologies that some could think they could use to pursue those goals of obliterating themselves. The attempt to hide oneself as a pattern of behavior, however, that they backs to those who chose to take the first such apple offered for enhancement purposes. After Adam and Eve sinned, they took fig leaves and made garments for themselves and then hid themselves among the plants and animals of the garden. Now often we are thought or talk about the making of clothing as a desire to cover the sexual organs. But more importantly is the fact that these garments were made of leaves created to hide their selves, to blend in with their surroundings of plants and leaves, for a self cannot be judged that the self cannot be found. Yet the reality remains that we are each a created self, a self who can enter into relationship with God's self and with other selves, real genuine selves, ultimately unable to escape this reality, even in their cyber world, cybernauts will then try to flee by plunging into deeper and deeper experiences of virtual sensuality to try to soothe the pain of the self separated from its true source and fulfillment, and that is God Almighty. One such escape, cyber sex, addiction has already become a horrible problem for many, destroying marriages and interfering with jobs, but can only grow more devastating as we think about increased integration of our minds with the internet, our computers, and cyber technology. We must also be cognizant of other concerns. Not only will our cybernetic connectedness provide opportunities for our access to others and information, but will also provide opportunities for others to have access to us. How much more will individuals be subject to those who wish to control and influence us? Will we be able to separate out images, instructions, or thoughts meant to influence us both from commercial and governmental sources? How much further will our privacy erode when the last bastion uh, of that privacy is our mind, when it is now open to the cybernetic web? And we must also consider a further danger. Will there be new types of electronic viruses that can damage our brains as well as the cybernetic equipment uh, inside us? A team at Los Alamos National Laboratory has been creating a new type of web server that continually rebuilds itself to adapt to users' needs. It puts in new hyperlinks wherever it thinks they'll open up a path that the servers are likely to use and closes down old ones that fall into disuse, basically resembling the way uh, neuronal connections grow and fade in the human mind. And in fact, this system uh, in the mind of the uh, designers who are putting it together is in essence the first step to creating a global brain that could be implemented in as little as five years from now. One of the creators of this type of system sees this global brain as the center of what he calls a new global superorganism. Human society will become more like an integrated body or organism, like an ant colony, with the web playing the role of the brain and the people playing the role of the cells in the body. Each individual user can be quickly identified as to his or her knowledge base or potential contributions to the whole by means of software devices known as cookies that embed themselves in a given individual system and can be used to track areas of interest, transactions, and so on. A simple form of cookie is now already available to us uh, online by sellers like Amazon that know when you sign on and give you a list of the things that they think might interest you. Uh, from your past interactions. This brain will also then have to protect itself, of course, and ensure that it, it has what it needs to thrive and grow. And as more and more of our business transactions, the control of our power and water supply, and so on becomes computer and network based, imagine the coercive powers that the system could have on an individual's life. Aside from some of the same issues raised by the quest for immortality and the remaking of man shared with cybernetics, nanotechnology poses its own unique threat, that of creating devices that could destroy life on a vast scale. And this is something that uh, Dr. Swenson mentioned Thursday night. Just as nanorobots could be used to repair um, injured cells, they can also be designed as killers microscopic mechanical plagues that could be carried by the winds or water supply. Nanorobots called assemblers would not only perform a specific function, but would be able to replicate themselves swiftly. As nanopioneer Eric Drexler stated, 
dangerous replicators could easily be too tough, too small, and too rapidly spreading to stop. We have enough trouble now controlling viruses and fruit flies. This threat has become known as the gray goo problem. And the gray goo threat makes one thing perfectly clear. We cannot afford certain kinds of accidents with replicating assemblers. Now, in this potential for mass destruction of life, a leader in the field of uh, computer software technologies, Bill Joy, uh, wrote a, a massive article in the April 2000 issue of Wired magazine. Joy is the co-founder and uh, chief scientist of Sun Microsystems, and he writes, quote, most dangerously for the first time, these accidents and abuses are widely within the reach of individuals or small groups. They will not require large facilities of raw materials or rare raw materials. Knowledge alone will enable the use of them. Thus, we have the possibility of not just weapons of mass destruction, but knowledge enabled mass destruction. This destructiveness hugely amplified by the power of self-replication. I think it is no exaggeration to say we are on the cusp of the further perfection of extreme evil, an evil whose possibility spreads well beyond that which weapons of mass destruction bequeath to the nation states onto a surprising and terrible empowerment of extreme individuals." Unquote. Joy then proposes that the only way then that we can prevent this potential devastation is to stop all research now to choose not to go down that road at all. As we all know, however, once knowledge exists, it will be used by someone. Therefore, the only way that knowledge will not be available for misuse is to not develop it in the first place. Now, Joy's comments have been severely criticized throughout the press and on the internet, not because his concerns are misplaced, but because his approach is naive. Research is a very hard, if not impossible, thing to restrict, particularly if private individuals are funding the research. And there will be plenty of millionaires seeking a supposed immortality who will serve as financiers. And we need think of only Saddam Hussein to come up with an individual who would willingly and happily exploit the development of nanotechnology for purposes of destruction alone, in spite of supposed bans. Meanwhile, with a ban on research in peace-loving environments, appropriate defenses would not be developed. One author drew the uh, comparison uh, to a historical model. In 1875, Great Britain, then the world's sole superpower, was sufficiently concerned about the dangers of the new technology of high explosives that it passed an act bearing, or barring all private experimentation in explosives and rocketry. And consequently, it was German missiles that bombarded London in World War II rather than the other way around. Rather, recognizing that research will proceed, we should move forward developing nanotechnology for its therapeutic benefits while concurrently identifying ways of detecting and inactivating harmful nano devices. Recommending a similar course, the Foresight Institute has just released their guidelines on molecular nanotechnology. And I do praise them for having the wisdom to engage in prospective efforts to understand and regulate new technology. I find, however, that though there are many statements within those guidelines that are well conceived, I also think their guidelines are also naive because they express a belief in the beneficence of industry and the adequacy of self-regulation. I do not share their optimism. There is no way to ensure that these or any guidelines will be universally followed and not everyone who will be able to create nano devices will employ the recommended, albeit excellent, internal devices or divine restrictions suggested to make the devices easy to inactivate. Their guidelines don't go far enough. Rather, active defense mechanisms can ultimately be the only true protection. It should be clear that from what I've shared with you thus far, these technologies are rapidly accelerating well ahead of sufficient ethical reflection and appropriate plans for control. We must commit ourselves wholeheartedly to analyzing the implications uh, of these devices yet to come and prepare to deal with them and contain them as necessary. We can no longer afford as a Christian community or as a, the community of man 
to deal with these concerns reactively has been the model of bioethics for over the past several decades. We must apply our scholarship prospectively, looking at what is and may be coming 5, 10, 20 years and beyond into the future. For with technological threats to alter the very nature or even the existence of humanity and our prevailing zeitgeist of materialistic postmodern culture, our world desperately needs the gospel. In Matthew 5:48, Jesus said, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And attempting to better ourselves is not necessarily wrong, but the Lord later adds in Matthew 6:31, Be not anxious, indicating that there are limits to the degree to which we should try by our own might to pursue this perfection. And we cannot even come close to achieving God's perfection by our own means, but only by our submission to his. Paul also records the Lord's words to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then later himself states in Philippians 4.11, For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Faced with the stark reality of our limitations, we as believers can rest in God, finding our worth not in our performance but in him. We must pursue God's vision of perfection for us, not our own vision corrupted by sin. God made us selves separate persons so that we can enter into relationship with him and each other and only as selves can we know love because it is stated in Luke 16:15, what is exalted by men is an abomination in the sight of God then any of the things I've been talking about this morning or any treatment that we may choose to employ indeed anything we want to pursue in this life must answer a crucial question does the choice at hand either for myself or others aid in the pursuit of the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, those of us who claim the name of Christ must let the vision of 2 Corinthians 3.18 guide us. We all, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness. Therefore, do we need these things to live as Jesus before and for the world? Thomas Paine wrote in Common Sense back in 1776, we have the power to begin the world all over again. And indeed, if the predictions of some of the scholars I've quoted this morning are correct, we live in just such a moment in history right now. We can be grateful for wonderful new technologies that help us to pursue the mission of compassion modeled for us by our Lord Jesus as he healed others. But we must not forget that he only healed what was lost by illness and the effects of sin. He did not make people smarter. He did not make them stronger or encourage them to pursue an earthly immortality. Rather, he did all these things to help people return to our Father and to seek eternal life with him. We must not let ourselves be deluded into thinking that technology will solve what at heart is the spiritual problem of the fall. We are being offered a Faustian bargain to create our own worlds in our selfish and sinful image, and we must reject it. Now, as, more, as much or more than at any time, in history, Christians must live authentically as Christians. While living in our modern and postmodern times, we must not show a fear of technology, but a courageous control of technology, rather than letting technology control us. We may enjoy the tool's legitimate fruits, using them for the good of all, but we must at every turn reject the virtual and its influence upon us, pursuing instead the authentic and reflecting the joy and fulfillment of real relationships, real life, and real freedom in Christ Jesus. There is a real alternative to the anxiety of our culture, the exhausting barrenness of unending competition, and the emptiness of loveless sensualism, be it real or virtual. It is the living, breathing body of Christ. It is us. We must commit ourselves to holy transformation so that when others look at us, they will not see virtual love or virtual Christianity, but the real thing, and then desire to join us. In The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis wrote, there neither is nor can be any simple increase of power on man's side. Each new power won by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he 
is also the prisoner who follows the triumphal car. Let us choose to faithfully find our triumph in the sufficiency and mercy of our Lord. And let us pray, as did King Arthur. May God give us the wisdom to discover the right, the will to choose it, and the strength to make it endure. We all really appreciate very much Dr. Hook's presentation and the sequence for this morning will be that we'll have our second presentation uh, by Dr.